Okay, I'm going to get started because uh, those people who have been part of the Black Arts Movement School modality know that we're, we always uh, jam in a lot of material um, into, our, into our session. So I'm Romy Crawford and um, we, are, we are in Milan and this is a fairly ambitious uh, setup. So please bear with us, um, ambitious in several ways. Um, one is that we started work this morning, Milan time, um, and with a, with a version of, of the Black Arts Movement School modality, Milan, Italian, um, which was curated by Magda Jurabin Pasfu, who I want to make sure you all can see and at least uh, witness. Um, she was really busy um, the last couple of months curating um, a version of this for this particular sector. And a lot of our morning's conversations was about locality and the specificity of location and the translation, of course, of, of Black American cultural stuff and material uh, in this other context or to this other uh, community. Uh, we talked about that in ways that problematized it and challenged it. And so that is that is where we start um, to today. And I think it's going to be really a, a rich conversation the next five days. So I just wanted to make sure that those of you from the, the US uh, uh, BAM school modality um, have an opportunity to to see and, and, and meet Magda. Do you just want to say? Hi, thank you. Uh, it was it is so nice to meet you, uh, even if you're so little uh, now. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm looking forward for our conversation, and I'm looking forward to learn a lot uh, from all of the speakers from the United States. Um, this morning we introduced the many ways in which we can uh, hybridate, I don't know what's the word like, metis ourselves. Um, and I think uh, it is very powerful this way of coming together of pedagogies and different experience of uh, blackness, but also, um, yeah, the several ways of being uh, black uh, that we uh, may uh, express through art uh, and dialogue. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to hear from you. Thank you, Magda. And that's exactly it. You know, we're 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 thinking about uh, blackness uh, this next five days as a, a complex as it is a, a, a idea construct as a complex uh, consciousness. We 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 kind of know historically that the positive it posit of it being uh, doubled in terms of a Du Boisian double consciousness, but I think we're moving into a conversation about the, the potential of its, uh, you know, spectral consciousness, multiplex consciousness, um, and more, and other other ways of speaking about it. We've been talking about the challenges of language. I think Magda is right on to say that, you know, we, we you know, the, the Matisse the mestizoization of it or creolization might be something that's cued by by um by the rainbow as well as so many other things so just very quickly um i uh you know if we could click to the slides i want to just give a very quick setup of, of why we're here you know we're at the mudec uh, museum here in in milan and um marina um, Pugliese, the director and curator, has put together a really amazing exhibition um, on, on the rainbow. And, and so uh, this is the catalog from the 1975 uh, exhibition um, on the, the rainbow, the rainbow book, um, which uh, is in the exhibition upstairs here. And, and also we're going to have um, uh, as a Coda or into the day, uh, Lanier Graham, who is the, the was the curator of that exhibition, is going to speak in the final session today. Um, and so, so that is the, is the starting point for the exhibition. It explores this 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 uh, this idea in so many different ways, uh, from the natural sciences to socially to to artistic, etc. Um, one of the, the, the exciting aspects of, of me and then those of us for the BAM school faculty, of course, is the rainbow uh, is easily explored. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Was interesting, uh, actually the next one of the wall first, is interesting to consider because of um, how it indicates um, uh, the, the aggregation. Of, of so many different elements and forms. And so part of the Black Arts Movement School modality is starting with cases of the of, of Black Arts practices, the radicalism, the experimentation, the improvisation, the collectivity and collaboration. And I would also then say after this session, the, the, the formal interest in aggregation 
of adding so many bits and pieces to make a work, which is an aspect of collaboration and collectivity, but this is more formally wrought. Um, and so, so we this came up a little bit this morning, and then we can go to a slide that's more recent of a work by Robert Earl Page, who's one of our um, uh, Black Arts Movement School Modality faculty. And this is a recent work of his, uh, made in the last year or so, where you also see that that's, that aggregation. And so we're going to uh, think about that and I think add that to our, to our set of themes and concerns that show up. And of course, the aggregation I'm talking about is there and present in the, the motif of the rainbow. It doesn't um, uh, over-isolate on one single color, but actually explores a range and a plethora and, and it allows for the inclusivity and the inclusion of other 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 spectrums, other colors. Um, so that is really key. Uh, finally, just want to say a few things for any of you that are that are new to the Black Arts Women's School modality uh, uh, classroom. Um, you know, there, there are two major moves. One is that which, which pays attention to the pedagogical within arts movement, black arts movement practices, that uh, interest and urge in, in uh, platforming um, workshops and programs and the uh, educational, what is educational. And then the other is a uh, key factor is the, the uh, intergenerationality. So this particular school uh, is really pushing that a little bit further. Um, it includes uh, people, faculty who were firsthand practitioners in the black arts movement, busy making work, doing things in the 60s and 70s. They are our primary faculty. And then also we have posits and, and, uh, and sessions by those of us who are, uh, you, you know, who are, who are serving as facilitators to, 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 their, to their efforts. And then also in this particular iteration, there are two uh, members of the Black Arts Movement School modality who have been uh, students in either one or all of the courses who are thinking about uh, work uh, along the same line. So if you think about it, we're actually passing the baton or thinking about how this um, school is about intergenerationality inter and, and, and moving forward um, and beyond <laughs> some of these themes and keeping them in, in motion if they are useful to us. So all of that is, is something for us to query. Okay, with that, we're going to get right to it. Um, the first presenter today is Professor Abdullah Kalimat. Um, the bios are on the website, so I don't give long introductions in, in BAM school, but I will say that uh, Abdullah Kalimat is, is one of the founders of Obasi, the Organization of Black American Culture, one of the conceptualists for the Wall of Respect mural, um, a scholar, a sociologist, and a writer whose most recent book is, I think, uh, The History of Black Studies. Um, and then uh, following um, uh, Professor Akalimat will be Professors Moten and Stefano Harney, who often work collaboratively and are going to present in a collaborative mode. They are the authors of the Undercommons and so many other uh, projects and, and, and writings. And then um, the uh, following them will be the artist, Inga McCannon, who is an artist and one of the founders, again, you're going to get the note of collectivity and collaboration here, of a group called Where We At, which was trying to address the exclusion of, of black women in some of the, 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 the uh, practices of that period, and also you see. So, and then, of course, this, this, uh, this final uh, word for, for today, which is by Lanier Graham, um, who was the curator of the original 1975 Rainbow Exhibition. So I hope that sums it up uh, efficiently enough. And um, now, Abdul Al-Kalimat. OK. Um, well, uh, ciao. Uh, OK, I am pleased to have this opportunity to discuss this topic, something I have lived and studied. Thank you, Romy, for inviting me. The United States of America is a rainbow country. Papish. People are all colors and come from all parts of the globe. This is a reality that has been suppressed and made to seem exceptional and not normal. In this slide, these buttons just suggest the ways in which the rainbow as metaphor has been used. I will explain. Next slide. So here's the outline of my talk. Why a rainbow? A historical awakening. Chicago's Rainbow Coalition. The transformation of knowledge and the current challenge. 
Next slide. Okay, first, why the rainbow as a U.S. metaphor? When you look at this map, it seems that this is a white country. This means composed of European descendants. The colors really are about concentrations at the county level. For the total population, European descendants, 60%. Latinos or Hispanics, 18.5%. Black people, African Americans, 12%. Asians, 5.6%. But now if you look at this map, you also see other con uh, concentrations. The upper left-hand corner, Alaska, native population dominate. In the lower right, you see the island of Puerto Rico. In the lower left, you see the territory connected to Mexico, where Latinos concentrate. And then that blue in the deep south, you see where black people continue to concentrate. This reflects population by counties. But some of these rural counties have very small populations. Next slide. <clears throat> the assertion that America is a white country is a lie. So what about the cities? Latinos or Hispanics constitute the largest ethnic population in places like El Paso and San Antonio, Texas in Miami, Florida, where more than six in 10 residents identify as Latino. Los Angeles, Houston, and Dallas each have very large Latino populations. Now, black residents outnumber any other race or ethnic groups in seven big cities, led by Detroit, where more than 75% of all residents identify as black. In other cities where black residents comprise the largest share of the population include Memphis, Tennessee, Baltimore, Maryland, Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, DC, the nation's capital, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. For all elementary and high school students in the United States, there's a different story. Out of 46.8 million students, 52% are Latino, African American, and Asian. White people at the elementary and secondary school level are a minority. So the future of the U.S. population is diversity. European descendants will be a minority. Slide. The changing population is one of the main reasons for the resurgence of white supremacy, the lie that the U.S. is a white country, flies in the face of historical accuracy. The descendants of people in this slide, from Asia, from Africa, the indigenous population, Latinos, are fast becoming a majority. The future will be different from the past as it always is. Slide. Sometimes this can be a hidden reality because people live in segregated areas and don't see each other. This slide is about the city of Chicago. Latinos, also called Hispanics, and African Americans. The darker the color, the greater the concentration. The white population of Chicago is only 45% of the total. The new black mayor of Chicago reflects this population diversity. Slide. In sum, the rainbow defines this country. People are black, brown, red, yellow, and white. Descendants from Africa, Latin America, Asia, indigenous people here before anybody else, and the descendants of Europe. This diversity defines a fundamental contradiction that plays out in culture, in politics, and every aspect of daily life. 
The underlying dynamic is class, as a vast majority of each ethnic group is in the working class. The capitalist ruling class is overwhelmingly white. Slide. A big breakthrough was the cry for black power that rang out in 1966. A spark for change that hit the consciousness of militant activists for change in all ethnic groups was the assassination of Malcolm X in 1965. He was a singular voice for the self-determination of black people, a message heard by militants in all ethnic groups who took it as their own mandate as well. Self-determination changed the strategy for change from civil rights to liberation, from seeking reforms to a more radical approach that relied on the community itself, the main force being the oppressed and not simply the allies in the white community. Slide. The rainbow was taken as a radical concept first in Chicago by poor and working class radicals in black, brown, and white communities. The Rainbow Coalition was an anti-racist, working class, multicultural movement founded April 4th, 1969 in Chicago, Illinois by Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party, along with William Preacher Man Fez Peran of the Young Patriots Organization and Jose Chacha Jimenez, founder of the Young Lords. Conflict was being turned into cooperation. Common problems were being recognized as needing common solutions. Slide. They adopted a button to symbolize the new unity of all colors of the rainbow of the humanity that actually exists. This was a bold rejection of the ruling class desire to keep poor people of all nationalities fighting each other. Slide. Now, black people took the initiative to form the Rainbow Coalition under the leadership of Chicago Black Panther Party Chairman Fred Hampton. Their 10 point program became a universal reference point for progressive change. Written in October 15, 1966. Let me go over this 10 point program. One, we want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our black community. Two, we want full employment for our people. Three, we want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. Four, we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. Five, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. Six, we want all men to be exempt from military service. Seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people. Eight, we want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. Nine, we want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in courts by a jury of their peers. And 10, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. Slide. Now, Puerto Rico is an island in the Caribbean is a 21st century colony of the imperialist U.S. state. The Black Panther Party stimulated Puerto Rican activists to form the Young Lords Party in Chicago on September 23, 1968. The Young Lords Party transitioned from a street gang that preyed on the community into a revolutionary organization that fought for the benefit of the community. The Young Lord's focus was on self-determination for Puerto Rico, other Latino and third world countries, and for neighborhood control development. 
The movement expanded from Chicago to include a broader audience and chapters in 30 cities, including three branches in New York City, the port of entry for the majority of Puerto Rican migrants. Slide. The Young Patriots Organization was an American left-wing organization of mostly white Southerners in Chicago. Go back one slide. Yeah. Originating in 1968, the organization was designed to support young white migrants from the Appalachia region who experienced extreme poverty and discrimination. The organization promoted Southern culture and used a Confederate battle flag as a symbol, leading Southerners into anti-racist advocacy. And you can well imagine how controversial that button was. In 1970, the Young Patriots formed an 11-point platform similar to the Black Panther Party's 10-point program. The Patriots platform shared the Panthers' opposition to the Vietnam War, police oppression, and capitalist exploitation. The two platforms were shared, also shared welfare-related goals, including improved education, housing, medical care, and access to clothing, and union reform that would address issues of racism uh, in the existing unions. The Young Patriots platform, including points that spoke about revolutionary solidarity and denounced racism. Slide. Now, Chicago was a base city for rainbow politics. What was also happening was the formation of national organization that had roots in each oppressed nationality. This slide contains images of newspapers of these organizations. The common focus, Latinos, Native Americans, African Americans, etc., was on fundamental social change that would transform the country by ending racism and capitalist exploitation. The key was self-determination, the fight for power by the people of each oppressed nationality moving forward in a united front. The rainbow fly. The rainbow flag was popularized also as a symbol of the gay community by San Francisco artist Gilbert Baker in 1978. The different colors are associated with diversity in the gay community. Also, the rainbow united people in a common struggle. Slide. Now the fighting spirit of self-determination sparked by black power spread to all aspects of society. It became a force aimed at transforming education, the production and function of knowledge. Black power created black studies, self-determination in knowledge production. This was an attack on racism, which had argued that black people were not agents of reason, were lesser human beings. First, there was the application of the Sankofa principle, a reevaluation of history. One advance was a reevaluation of what had been happening in black colleges formed after the Civil War in the 19th century. They were centers of black academic excellence, creating a treasure trove of scholarship and creativity. Another advance was a recognition of knowledge production and memory institutions in the segregated black community, libraries, museums, literary societies, high schools of academic excellence and cultural creativity. And then there's a role of education in the main social movements that have advanced the fight for freedom. There are at least six major ways to think of these social movements. The freedom movement, the black power movement, the black women's movement, the black arts movement, the black workers movement, 
and the black student movement. And finally, the 1966 Black Power Movement led to massive enrollments of black college students. They confronted institutional racism and created black studies within mainstream institutions. Now black studies is in over 70% of all institutions of higher education in the United States. But what happened in the street, the rainbow, started happening on campus. Slide. Black studies led to Puerto Rican studies, Chicana, Chicano, and Latina, Latino studies. In general, ethnic studies. More than this, it led to women's studies, gender studies, and gay studies. The norm used to be Eurocentric, a knowledge system predicated on what served a racist, oppressive structure of society. The self-determination of oppressed nationalities in knowledge has ended this. The phrase critical race theory is just another way of saying black studies, of saying anti-racism, of saying ethnic studies, or pointing, pointing to the self-determination of the silenced other. Today, the battle is on. Slide. A symbol of racist white power is the governor of the state of Florida, Ron DeSantis. This is a case of the most right-wing policies at the state level, as the Republican Party has a supermajority in the state legislature, so it can pass bills of its pure fantasy of what is good for the state, advancing racism. This guy is against any history that makes white children feel bad. So history has to be whitewashed. So what happened didn't happen. He supports banning books and placing teachers under a gag order, forbidding any discussion of racism or gender diversity under threat of jail or loss of job. He attacks unions and also attacks capitalists, you know, all to base his political future on racism and homophobia. If ever there was a need for a rainbow of progressive forces, it is now. Slide. So in this side, slide, we see the founder of critical race theory, the law professor Derek Albert Bell Jr., who argued in the 1970s that the legal system was thoroughly racist and must critically be dealt with. He was followed by Kimberly Crenshaw, who popularized the concept of critical race theory and added the notion of intersectionality that spread critical race theory to all realms of knowledge. Critical race theory and intersectionality is being backed by social forces like the Black Lives Matter movement. What we face are the network of rabid racist militia and billionaire fanatics. But history is with the rainbow and not the racist MAGA movement. We stand with Langston Hughes, the poet, who wrote, let America be America again, the land it never has been yet and yet must be, the land where everyone is free. And that's what I have to share with you this morning. So thank you for sharing this time with me. Grazie, grazie. use this to make it work. Thank you so much, Professor Akalimat. Um, and we're going to hold some of our questions towards the, the end. Um, and now we move to a session um, with Stefano Harney and Fred Moten. Buona giornata a tutti. I'm going to start out a little bit and then uh, Fred's going to come in. 
um, first, uh, I would like to start by just saying thank you to Romy for inviting us and having us here. Um, thank you also to Dio and to Lashonda for everything you do to make these things possible. Uh, and also just to say that it's always a humbling honor to be in the same program with Professor Al Kalimat. So um, thank you for your wonderful presentation, Professor. What I what I would like to start by doing is to, uh, just to give us a little provocation about what it means for us to be together. Um, of course, a lot of what it means for us to be together, and when I say us, I mean those of us who are speaking primarily out of American context and those speaking primarily out of an Italian context, uh, recognizing, of course, that those contexts themselves are quite complex and differentiated. It would seem that we're here to encounter each other in our experiences and the rainbow becomes the bridge, let's say. Um, but, but what Fred and I would like to talk about is that this uh, encounter that we are definitely having and is important is nonetheless actually quite an entangled encounter, one in which there is a history uh, of entanglement. And we think it's interesting to look at this history, not just because uh, it shows us how little we're being taught about this history or how hard it is to get to know it, but because the history was consequential. The form of the entanglement was, was very consequential. It was consequential for what subsequently developed in Italy in particular, and it was also consequential for what didn't develop in Italy. Um, and that's why we think it's worth just revisiting a little bit this, these previous entanglements. Um, making sense so far? Following me? Everybody's hearing me? Okay. Um, there's two, possibly three, we'll see how much more uh, uh, we expand into it, but there's certainly two periods that we want to focus on with regard to a discussion about our previous historical entanglements. This is primarily going to be in the register of politics and radical politics, but, but also in the register of radical aesthetics. I'm going to stick for now to the, to the politics. I'm speaking particularly about the late 1950s and then the late 1960s, in which in Italy, um, we have uh, uh, significant movements in political thought and political action. Political thought mostly in the 50s, political action at the end of the 60s. That movement is deeply informed by African-American thought and African-American struggle in both instances. Um, and, and probably we, we speak too little about this. First of all, to be informed about it, and second of all, to understand uh, the, the, not only the entanglement, but also the, the mistranslations and the missed opportunities that come along the way, um, with an eye for thinking about whether we could do it differently. Primarily, Fred and I are talking about connections between the industrialized north of Italy and Detroit which is very much on um, the, the radar for, for the Italian left uh, because of the, uh, the car industry in particular, and then most especially because of the radicalism that developed in Detroit. Turin is obviously a center for that, but, but just as much Milan, just as much Cremona, Padua, etc. In fact, I want to start in Cremona with a guy called uh, Daniele Montaldi, not somebody that you really know much about today. He was the son of an anarchist who fought in the resistance. He himself, very early on, started to see the Italian Communist Party and the Italian unions as more of a problem for Italian workers than, than necessarily a solution, a common theme that develops through the 50s and 60s but is, is, is deeply influenced and aided by what they're reading and who they're talking to. 
So Maltaldi starts a group called uh, Unita Proletaria, Grupo Unita Proletaria, and they begin to make connections internationally with other dissident groups who are unhappy with the position of the official communist party, who's unhappy with the Soviet Union, often unhappy with their unions. One of the groups they get in touch with and begin to translate the work of is a group called Correspondence, a group that was started by C.L.R. James in Detroit, also included many other important figures in the, in the Detroit um, sort of radical intellectual milieu of the late 60s and 70s, Martin Glaberman, uh, Grace Lee Boggs, uh, um, uh, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the first uh, pieces of work they encounter in, in this regard is a book called The, the American Worker, um, which is a, a book produced by a worker in Detroit about working in the car plants. Uh, the pseudonym of the author is, is uh, Paul Romano, but it's also uh, co-written with an, a pseudonym of Grace Lee Boggs, who's deeply involved. The book is very much in, encouraged by C.L.R. James, and it becomes uh, a text that's translated into Italian in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, and gets widely circulated together with a, a text that's also inspired by it from France by a guy called uh, Maté, who works in the um, Renault factory. This is the beginning of a shift in the Italian left to focus on the workers at the point of production. This is how Maltaldi would talk about it. We got to think primarily that the worker's life is based on what goes on in the workplace at the point of production. We can't be thinking of the worker as primarily a member of the Communist Party or primarily as a member of a union. That's not his or her actual life. His or her actual life is what he or she is able to organize on the Florida factory. And that's where we should be studying and that's where we should expect the politics. Again and again, materials from the from the radical black radical tradition are gonna are gonna circulate uh, as part of the thinking develops. A second person that I want to draw your attention to as part of this is a guy from Milan actually called Ferruccio Gambino. I don't know if anybody knows him, he's still alive, he's still teaching in in uh, in Padua, I believe. Now, Gambino was early on uh, uh, invited to come to Detroit, went to Detroit, uh, actually studied with the correspondence group, brought back further work and influence and, and ideas, and and he himself was involved in all of the the the, the major kind of uh, outlets of the time, starting with Guadagni Rossi, going on to, you know, um, the uh, workers' power, et cetera, et cetera. The struggle continues. All the major uh, journals of the left that were all beginning to talk about how the workers could self-organize. They were all moving uh, in a direction that the correspondence was already uh, exploring um, in the 40s and 50s. Um, Gambino's an interesting figure. If we're sitting in Milan because he was in uh, Piazza Fontana when the bomb went off in 1969. He wasn't injured, but um, but I believe he was rounded up as, as so many on the left were, despite the fact that like most of the bombings in Italy in this period, it was actually carried out by the right uh, and uh, with the, with the uh, collusion of the Italian government. In this case, actually, the Piazza Fontana one is interesting from a historical point of view, because they actually indicted an American too, uh, a, uh, uh, you know, a military attaché who was involved with this. In any case, he was living in the big student, uh, the uh, Casa Studente that was was being squatted at the time, and he was he was part of that whole milieu, and he was bringing across constantly this 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 thought from correspondence from the whole group. Then the group itself began coming. George Rawick came over. Um, Grace Lee and James Boggs uh, toured Italy, et cetera, et cetera. All this is going on into the, into the uh, mid-late 60s. It's at that point that we get a kind of second uh, set of connections with the, the rise of the League in Detroit and with the, um, the, the touring of the film finally got the news that we shared with you, where again, the impact of the thinking going on in Detroit becomes incredibly profound uh, for, for the Italian left. 
But here's the one last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Fred, who may want to say more about some of the thought going on in uh, in these groups or, or, or whatever else, Fred, you want to do. But um, somewhere around 1970, so 69, as you know, if you, I don't know if you know, but, you know, is, is the hot autumn. Uh, and then, you know, it doesn't get much cooler right up till the year led from there. But by like 1970, 71, 72, basically the car plants are proving CLR James's point, which is also turns out to be Mario Tronti's point, which is the workers first, then capital. Workers struggle determines the direction of capital. This is what James had been saying, and this is what Tronti was saying. Um, and given the circulations, it's hard to believe that um, these these were not ideas that influenced each other. But here's the point: by the early 70s, Fiat's already saying we're going to move our factories around. We're going down to Sicily, etc. But they didn't go down to Sicily to employ people. They went down to Sicily to build a a factory that didn't need people. Right? This is also the point in the early 70s where they're saying, you know, even though they were already struggling with a workforce from southern Italy. They didn't seem to want to be fully incorporated through the unions, et cetera, which is one of the major points raised by the left. They're also saying, you know, maybe it'd be a good idea to get some people from North Africa in here.